record on this computer. All right, so uh, thank you. Welcome all for uh, to another edition of Understanding Film or whatever we call this thing with Mike Reif. We are happy to have you back, sir. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, take it away. I will turn off my little camera here and we'll hear about uh, Catherine Bigelow. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to share a screen. I'm going to go with this. Terrific. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Catherine Bigelow's 2009 film. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of her previous work and then the work after this, give you a bit of an overview of her overall oeuvre, as Izzy might say, uh, toward the end of this, this brief uh, presentation on The Hurt Locker. The Hurt Locker stands out for a couple of big reasons. Uh, for one, of course, it is Best Picture winner of 2009 of the Academy Awards. It is also Best Director winner for 2009. And it's important to note this is the first time in almost 100 years of Oscars being given out that uh, the award went to a woman, which, which seems like a big problem for Hollywood uh, that it took that long, but uh, it's certainly well-deserved by Bigelow here, who has evolved as a filmmaker by the time that she makes The Hurt Locker in 2009, as we'll talk about. Uh, so there we go. The Hurt Locker is a film um, uh, set in Iraq in 2004, I believe, maybe 2008, uh, but at the, the height of the insurgency and is concerned with bomb techs. It's con instead of being a traditional war film where you have sort of large troop brigades facing off against other troop brigades of two opposing sides. Catherine Bigelow digs into this one niche element of the Iraq war, and an important one too, right? If you were around during the Iraq war, as, as you and I were, Alex, and of course everybody on this call, um, one of those elements of the Iraq war that was especially problematic for American and, and international troops were IEDs, improvised explosive devices. And so this film is devoted to uh, a, a trio of bomb diffusers who go into these spaces and diffuse the bombs either wear, using robots or wearing this giant suit as we'll see. So that's sort of like the setup of the plot. Um, another important element though of this film as we'll talk about is how it really digs into these minute details. And so instead of again sort of having lavish battle sequences or, or sort of a you know hyper violent ones it's more sort of a, a suspenseful film it's more of a thriller almost puzzles because each bomb situation that Catherine Bigelow films here um, is like a puzzle that the bomb diffusers have to figure out so it's a very different kind of war film than probably people had been used to seeing in 2009. Um, this kind of uh, unconventional take on war films kind of really takes off in this time period the messenger with Woody Harrelson also comes out around this time where He's a, a soldier that has to sadly alert families in the United States that their, their fellow soldiers passed. Um, so you get a bunch of different films that kind of have this iconoclastic approach. This is not Platoon, this is not Saving Private Ryan, this is a very different approach uh, to war zones. But I want to talk today really about sort of the way that uh, Bigelow is a master at sort of framing uh, key scenes and talk about some of the key techniques she uses to get there. Uh, so we're not going to really talk about the entire film or even necessarily a Bigelow style, but she's really almost like Hitchcock. She knows how to uh, construct a scene sort of inch by inch, step by step for maximum suspense, but also uh, maximum immersion, which is something obviously Hitchcock wasn't about. He was more of sort of distancing. Uh, Bigelow really wants to put you into the sequences as much as uh, frame them very carefully. So the first sequence is actually the first shot of the film uh, is through this sort of distorted lens. We're not really sure what we're seeing, but it turns out it's the camera from one of the bomb diffusing uh, robots. And we can't hear it, right? We don't have sound in these presentations for understanding film for the Pena and Public Library. Uh, but uh, if you're watching it, you have sort of the sound of the robot going over the rocks. You also hear the call to prayer, the Islamic call to prayer. You hear the, the bustling of the city because this one is mostly taking place in urban spaces. So we get this you know, immediate immersion right here through the robot's lens, and then we cut away to seeing it sort of rapidly going over. Uh, and of course, we can see uh, soldiers and Humvees in the background, but uh, part and parcel with Catherine Bigelow, she's going for those details often missed in, in genre films, um, whether it's science fiction or early times in horror, or here with the war films. So it's like focusing on the robots, not what you would expect, it'd be the soldiers, and we start off with this. Then we cut to seeing sort of how the soldiers are using it. They're looking through this uh, lens and we can see a soldier to the left here and they're looking through the monitor. And the important point here too is we get this close-up of them using these little toggles. 
this is going to be really key to sort of the, the stamp of what Catherine Bigel is doing in this film, this hyper attention to detail. Uh, not simply that, you know, here's the control panel you would use to control a robot, but the texture of the gloves, the dust on a control panel, really crucial to what she's trying to do, the, the realism in the sequence, in the whole entire film too. Um, then we cut to these, uh, for the first time, we get to see the soldiers, a Kuleshov effect, of course, if you were with us for the life of Pi, the character looking at something. Um, they're far away from the bomb, right? They're using the robot, but that's going to be part of the tension of the sequence. What's great about this film, too, is that so... Um, Partly this is to build suspense. We have lots of people watching the US soldiers. At first, it's just people living their lives though. And so both in terms of who's watching them and what does that mean, how that evolves into dread as some sequences go on. But sometimes it's like this, just people in their sort of rooftop areas hanging up the laundry. And it's a reminder that amongst uh, the war that's happening in Iraq, there's a lot of normal people living their lives too. So she's cutting throughout this opening sequence showing all these people just living in the city that's under occupation. More ominous are these kind of shots where sort of looking through chain link down at them. So not only is it sort of um, who's watching, but also because of the angle, we're looking down at the characters, you feel like you're more in power. So if there's someone observing them from this point of view, it feels like maybe someone's watching them with nefarious ends. Um, and it, so we have that sort of building tension a little bit early on, but also we have this moment where uh, these goats come uh, hurrying through. So this wide shot's great because you can see some of the modern architecture, this bridge here and some of these uh, buildings, but also the way that war has already taken its toll, this rubble stream road, a broken down car and these goats that are sort of just being herded through the city, right? People have to eat. And this is part of what's happening in, in the city at the time. We start really building scenes, uh, tension in the sequence, uh, more through these kind of POV shots, looking through the lens as they're watching out, you know, who might be, um, you know, having designs on the soldiers as they're trying to defuse this bomb. Even here where we're looking through uh, the bomb suit up at the helicopter, another point of view shot. So numerous ways that Bigelow is trying to lodge us in the character's point of view. But then we get this point, right? The scene starts out, the robot, finds the bomb, then the robot's gonna bring munitions out uh, and, and so they can blow up the bomb without anybody getting there, uh, implode it. But then the wagon breaks down. And so now we have this situation where technology has failed them and we have to get back to sort of human interaction. So the main character of the scene, Guy Pierce, uh, played by Guy Pierce here, puts on the bomb suit. Uh, and even just the way that Catherine Bigelow shows each step, put on the helmet, put on the straps, there's camaraderie too, there's dialogue going back and forth. Um, they're sort of joking because they've done this quite a few times. Uh, but then as sort of the bomb suit gets out there, and we have the heavy breathing within the bomb suit, we can hear Guy Pierce breathing, we can hear the tension, the music is also ramping up. We, we again get these kind of POV shots. Uh, we can tell something's not right, the music's rising. We get this shot where, again, he's so small in the frame, seemingly powerless. And indeed, um, as the soldiers behind him are kind of joking around, getting their eye off the, the ball a little bit, uh, we see someone does activate uh, the weapon. And so then at this moment, right, to sort of finish, finish the, the overall tension, um, it's both release and also sort of um, freezing time. Uh, very stylish uh, slow motion photography here. Uh, not only the, the, the bomb diffuser running away from the bomb going off, but even sort of the shockwave, the power of the munitions sending you know, dust off this abandoned car that we'd seen earlier. So from this sequence, we can get the initial sort of uh, uh, texture and the initial architecture of a Catherine Bigelow um, action sequence with characters we haven't met before. This is the opening sequence, the first five minutes. Sort of uh, using framing to both show uh, close-ups, to show the intimate details, wide shots, to show kind of who's watching them uh, and the powerlessness and this big situation that they're in, as much as also these more stylists and uh, hyper detailed sequences. As the film goes on though, uh, we get introduced to a new character, sort of a wild uh, risk taking figure played by Jeremy Renner. I'll also note that this film's populated with actors that go on to do Marvel films. So you might recognize Jeremy Renner from the Avengers films who plays Hawkeye. Um, uh, we also have the character who plays Sam Wilson. Um, 
later on Falcon, we already saw him. Guy Pierce was in Iron Man 3. Uh, also, uh, Jeremy Renner's wife at the end of the film was in Ant-Man 2. So, I mean, there's just all these character actors that are in this 2009 film that go on to be in Marvel films. But anyways, I digress. Uh, so Jeremy Renner's character shows up and we see that he doesn't like to play by the same rules. So it's an added ingredient. We've had this original kind of classic tense sequence, but now she, Catherine Bigelow includes this new ingredient, this character who's also unpredictable. So the situation's unpredictable, but now the protagonist of the film is also unpredictable. So the first time we see him go out with the same crew, um, we get some wide shots. We're not quite sure what the situation is. Again, sort of like pull the camera back, make them seem small. We're not really sure what the situation is. Classic, like the first sequence of this sort of dangling heart off of this wire, it kind of catches the eye there. Again, we have characters, but it's early on in the sequence. So we can see this pattern forming. These children must be innocent, much like that woman hanging up the laundry. We'll get other observers as the, the sequence goes on that are less so innocent. But again, a reminder here, these kids sort of watching and laughing and playing around. What are these Americans doing here? Um, a reminder of who is being caught up in this battle at war. But what happens is Jeremy Renner's character puts on the bomb suit and instead of working with his teammates like in the previous sequence, he pulls out a gas grenade. And uh, he says it's a diversion from the you know, potential Iraqi um, militants, but what happens is his own people, his own teammates can't see what's happening. And so we have Sanborn here, who's supposed to be supporting him in a panic, what's happening? And by doing that, We've already kind of gotten used to this character, Bigelow's placing our anxiety within this character. So Jeremy Renner is sort of off being the wild character he is, and our anxieties are mirrored to this character. Um, Catherine Bigelow is really good at kind of connecting the audience with a couple key uh, empathy points throughout sequences, and we have uh, Sanborn as that kind of figure. As the sequence goes on though, much in the same way that we had that moment where the robot's uh, wagon breaks, we have a break in this sequence too, or sort of a development of tension. A taxi car drives through and we're thinking, what's this gonna be? What kind of situation is this? Comes to a screeching halt, we see Renner uh, plot a gun. And we have this super close up sequence where it's sort of this look, we see through the eyes literally of this uh, taxi driver, and then the Kuleshov effect also of Renner in his bomb suits. This sort of human connection moment, even though they're, you know, we don't know what the taxi driver's intention is, uh, we don't know what Renner is capable of by this point in the film, but Catherine Bigelow, even though it's tense, it's a new surprise in the sequence, slows it down so we have this human connection moment. Um, he, you know, shoots out a window to try to move the taxi back, but we can see he's not trying to do actual body, uh, bodily harm to the taxi driver. Uh, and then the American troops sort of swarm in and carry him out. And he sort of ruefully laughs and says, you know, if he wasn't a militant yet, he is now in the way that he's being treated by everybody else. Um, the sequence then goes on and he finds one bomb and fixes it. Uh, and then he finds this whole nest of them. So Catherine Bigelow's kind of moved from what's the, the tension, what's the problem, to the taxi driver appearing, that problem's uh, diffused, finding the first bomb, that problem's diffused, and we have this huge nest. So we have this incremental growth of problems in this sequence, classic building of suspense. But at the end of the day, instead of some kind of, again, gun battle or some kind of great um, uh, bravado act of, of heroism, it's just down to getting in the dirt, getting his hands on the wires, snipping here, snipping there, the engineering, the science of diffusing a bomb. And that's the end of the sequence. And so we have all this tension building up and we have this sort of eerie sequence and, and we have the, the sound effect where like one part of the music's going up and one part's going down. It has that kind of off-putting element right in this moment. But at the end of the day in this film, what often happens is we don't want to see a good out outcome is not explosions, there's not guns going off, it's nothing, it's just a couple snips. And so this is sort of this interesting juxtaposition that Catherine Bigelow builds throughout the film. All this tension and then the release is something very tangible and very analog uh, and very sort of skill-based. One final sequence to break down here, perhaps the biggest and lavish of the film uh, is at a UN base. So again, we have this wide shot, we have all these people streaming out of the UN base, uh, we have that local perspective. Uh, someone that lives in Iraq is, is briefing Renner's character here on the situation. 
Uh, and, and again, we have that opening moment where everything's in control. We can see Renner in his bomb suit. We can see the Humvee. Everyone's walking in, in perspective. Uh, this sequence, though, uh, we have this moment where a militant sort of sneaks up and he has his rifle. We're not exactly sure what the intention is of this moment. Maybe he might shoot at Renner. It turns out something different. Um, he fires off a, a, a one bullet that erupts the gas tank, and I'll show you an image of that in the car. We see soldiers firing, but it's almost at, at, at that militant, he runs away. It's almost sort of an anti-gun battle, though. It doesn't lead to anything. Uh, it, and so it's, again, in the trend line of this film that these kind of moments of guns going off isn't really what's going to solve the problem. It's going to have to be something else in this conflict. So the cars erupted in flames. Obviously, uh, the militant wanted to just sort of heat up the bombs so they blow up instead of shooting at any one soldier. And we can see Renner there with this tiny little um, uh, flame or, or fire extinguisher, and he extinguishes it somewhat improbably. But you know, I'm not I'm not a scientist. Maybe that works that way. Uh, so that's right. So again, Catherine Bigelow. We have our first problem: the car is on fire. He puts it out and he opens it up and there's this gigantic amount of munitions in there. And he says, there's enough boom in here to send us all to Jesus. So this is more than anything that he's confronted in his long career of defusing bombs. The sequence then continues to build because it's such a wide space, unlike in the earlier sequences, this entire UN complex with all these people. But instead of that militant or maybe someone uh, with a phone that might have ill designs, really fascinating part of the sequence is most of them are filming them. Uh, and so the question throughout this moment is, are they filming them just because they're an occupying force and the Iraqi people are like, what's going to happen? I'm going to film these, these strange individuals in my city. Or is it someone with ill designs, right? This is around the time of the Blackwater uh, sequence where Blackwater uh, contractors were killed and it was turned into a YouTube uh, gruesome event. And the characters even mentioned, this guy, I'm afraid, is going to put me on YouTube. So you have this moment where all these people are watching. But it also calls into question, well, what happens when you're in an urban space um, again, sort of an occupying force, trying to bring order perhaps, but also all these people live there, living their own lives, they're gonna be watching. And sort of uh, throughout the sequence, we see all these people in different places. This one, way up on a minaret, so again, that high versus low dynamic Bigelow's building. What's interesting about this scene though is, is how it really kind of strips it down to the minimalism, uh, whereas other sequences kind of built up. So here Renner actually takes off the bomb suit, takes off his headset, uh, and he just goes in, uh, there's a headset on the ground, he just goes into the, the car. And in this sequence, especially, we see Renner won't stop. He goes from the trunk into the backseat, he's ripping up the backseat, he's trying to find that one ignition, that one little device that actually triggers the bomb. His, his friends, Sanborn's telling him, leave it, we'll have other people come in and you know, hopefully you know, implode the car, tow it away. Renner won't stop. It's something about the puzzle of the bomb defusal is what matters. He pulls out the CD thing, uh, the CD tape deck here, and it triggers this shriek. And we think, well, is the car gonna blow up? No, it's just the wipers are activated, They're kind of streaking back and forth on a dry glass pane. But at the end of the day, again, um, it's not the explosion. In many ways, you know, maybe we've been programmed with war films. We want to see some kind of eruption. We want to see some kind of grand, you know, destruction towards the end as the heroes get away. But he's able to finally get this dead man switch, as he calls it, and he snips it. And so we have this kind of through line with all of her, her great sequences. They're both beautifully put together for high tension, but they also have this kind of contradictory diffusion towards the end, almost like um, she's diffusing the bomb of her own suspense sequences. A couple final points here. So that's sort of like, I think what this film is known for, are those really highly constructed sequences. And I wanna break down why I think they work. Uh, it's also important to note though, this film does a pretty good job. Of, it's not the main detail, but a pretty good job of sort of showing what the city looks like under occupation, which is rare for Iraq war films, um, even of the time. And, and I would say that Iraq war films, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, Iraq too, I should say, uh, Desert Storm, um, you know, they, they take on different frames, but this is one of the only ones I, I've seen that really kind of shows the urban landscape. And yes, we have the Humvee, but we also see all these different elements. You know, life is in some ways kind of going along as normal. Uh, and even this perspective here, right? He's got this big gun, but everyone else is kind of just, you know, they're driving around packets of rice and stuff. There's a little transport bus and the cars there. 
on the base too, um, you know, we have the culture of the base. We have the Iraqi individuals who come and sell things. Um, and we can see so that interaction within the base community, which will be important in a moment. We have this boy Beckham who's selling uh, DVDs, you know, uh, to Renner's character here, uh, Lieutenant James, and they sort of strike up a friendship. And, you know, at times they play soccer together. There's even a moment where Renner goes into an Iraqi uh, neighborhood on his own mission. And it's interesting because he sort of hops, he hops over this fence and you expect, you know, what, what are we going to see here? Within the house, it's totally like you'd see in an American middle class house. We've got a flat screen TV, we've got lamps, we have this, this cabinet with some nice stuff in there. He talks to a man who's a university professor that looks like a university professor here. He's got his vest on, looks like an outfit I would wear. Uh, and so we have this moment and these pepperings throughout the film that Iraqi culture isn't very much so, you know, put aside the religion and the history, although of course we have plenty of Islamic uh, Muslim Americans, but uh, we have, you know, a sense that there are these pockets even under war that are just like any other westernized or developed areas, just that it's been under for many years, the reign of Saddam Hussein and now of course the occupation. The film, in terms of uh, U.S. soldiers, right, the main characters, uh, talks a little bit about sort of mental health and PTSD. We have a character on the left who uh, feels as though he'd failed a compatriot, and so he's wrestling with that guilt. But it's not a major element of the film. There's other films like Stop Loss that, that consider that a little bit more of the same time period. More importantly, um, it's sort of, uh, or more prevalently, um, obviously the, the struggle with PTSD is, is very important. I'd also put out there uh, Deborah Granick's 2018 film, uh, Leave No Trace is a great film about returning veterans struggling with PTSD. Uh, but in this film, we have early on the sequence where Sanborn goes and, and pays homage to a fallen uh, comrade and he looks in the cask and we can see the helmet and some other things, the dog tags are over here and also the American flag and its triangle. And uh, there's the dog tags there. And there's so many fallen soldiers that sort of just putting them in these, these little uh, baggies and tossing them in this trough here. Later on, when James uh, arrives in Iraq from Afghanistan, there's a moment where he says, can we take these wooden boards off the window? And, and Sanborn's saying, well, we put the boards up there in case mortar rounds come into the base and lateral frags or lateral shrapnel might crash through the windows. And, and, and James says, yeah, well, but yeah, that's not going to stop a mortar round from coming through the ceiling. Uh, it's the kind of moment that tells you, okay, Lieutenant James thinks differently, uh, but it's also the kind of scene where Bigelow is showing you all the tiny details that are, that are peppered throughout this micro culture. Uh, the idea that the, there's boards on the windows, uh, they're there in, in, in case there's mortar rounds. I mean, unless you've done the research, and she did um, research this quite much, uh, quite well with uh, Mark Bull, her, her frequent screenwriter. They also wrote together uh, Zero Dark Thirty after this about the CIA and Detroit following. Um, this kind of extreme attention to detail and the practical nature of so many things happening here. And of course, in the military, quite a bit is practical. And, with, and then also this poetic moment where he looks out so he can enjoy the sun. I mean, it's a war zone, but he wants to have that ability to sort of take in uh, a moment of relaxation. Uh, later on, we have a moment where, uh, sort of echoing that earlier sequence, about an hour later in the film, we see that, that James goes to bed with his helmet on. Um, is it because of the, the mortar rounds that might come through the ceiling or more likely is it sort of he's using that practical thing, that symbol, it's the helmet he wears when he wears the bomb suit as a way to cope so he can get to sleep at night. Um, it's not explained, it's not a dialogue sequence, just this visual image here. But finally, um, early, earlier in the film, to the, as opposed to the last sequence, we get this moment where he calls home. And we see his wife here pick up the phone, we see his, his son, and he can't answer, he can't talk to her on the phone. And so she just has to hang up. She thinks it's him, but she doesn't know. And then there's a coda at the end of the film where he does go home. And what's interesting about this sequence is it looks to you know, a, a, an individual who's going to the supermarket frequently, like any old supermarket. But we can tell through Renner's performance, this is a very uh, difficult and disassociating sequence. We start off here and actually the, the, the shot begins just looking at the glass case and we can see this warped image of Renner, the warped reflection, and then it pulls back and we can see him walking down um, the aisle. And then he's told by his wife to go get some cereal. And, and he says, where is the cereal aisle? He doesn't know. He ends up here and we have this kind of wide but angled shot. It's the only one like this 
that also places Renner uh, over to the right and, and downward. And we can see sort of this wall of cereal is very um, overwhelming to him. Uh, and we have this very close up and, and also deep shot, right? So his face is in focus, but all the, um, I guess, my breakfast bars are also in focus, um, which, which sort of compresses the image almost, again, like he's being overwhelmed. We get this cool shot where he looks, and it's just more cereal, and we cut back, and it's, you know, he doesn't know what to do. He's, he's this master of figuring out puzzles when he's in the war zone with the most dangerous things, these IEDs. He can't figure out what to get for the cereal. And he even hits this little um, tag here, sort of frustrated, right? I can't use my ability, and the frustrations are boiling over. Um, and even the way that we're sort of now looking up the, the largeness of that red square there. We see also these mundane tasks he's doing at home. He's cleaning up the gutter. But even just the way this, this sequence is shot, dripping water, it's fall or, or near winter. Of course, it's a totally different kind of environment than what he's used to in the dry heat of Iraq, but also sort of this mundane task uh, on his ladder at his house. Uh, we get moments like this where um, it's just a lingering shot of him looking into space with the static. Um, he's clearly sort of trying to process some things that have happened overseas. And then moments like this where, um, you know, we, we may think, of course, that they're preparing dinner. Uh, Evelyn Lilly here playing his wife is just cutting up carrots, and he's talking about how uh, he needs to get back. He knows that bombs are still going off, Humvees are still getting destroyed, people are dying. Um, and he's sort of looking out the window, hoping, you know, I, I shouldn't be here cutting carrots and, 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 you know, cleaning off mushrooms. I should be over there. We get this moment where she covers him up in the frame. And we get a sense here where she's like, can you just cut the carrots, and then she leaves. Um, you know, you might read that scene and be like, well, she's unfeeling, but if we sort of look at it from her perspective, he's talking about death, he's talking about also maybe going back and, and putting himself back in danger when they have this infant son. She's in a difficult position too, uh, as we learned that he's been doing multiple tours, he's defused 800 bombs, that's a long time away from home. We have this final dialogue sequence though at home where um, first of all, we have this kind of interesting symbolism of the Jack in the Box, right? Like the earliest, uh, I don't want to say IED, but so the earliest surprise, right? It pops out uh, this mechanical device of, of surprises. But he's talking to his son. And he's talking about how, you know, as you get older, uh, maybe you only care about two things uh, and maybe only, I only care about one. It's a very sort of grim and said scene, we see his infant son here, is even with all that hope and possibility, it isn't enough. And, and the implication is the one thing he only cares about now because of his intense experiences is bomb defusal. Um, what I think is important, this is a shot from Near Dark though, <clears throat> we'll get there, is that throughout this entire film, so this is a very intense moment and it's a very sad code in some ways, we see his struggles at home. But I don't think it's just the fact that uh, at home he doesn't have that adrenaline rush. I mean, I know the opening quote of the film is from Chris Hedges says, war is a drug. And that's true. That's, that's an element of the film. But it's also about cultures. It's about sort of the microcultures that these characters exist within. When he's with his bomb disposal crew, it's just them. We really only see them interact with other soldiers and units rarely throughout the film. It's really just those three. Renner, Sanborn, and the gentleman who's struggling with PTSD, we saw it's just those three. So it's sort of this micro community, and they're the only ones that fix bombs. Uh, they don't bring in, you know, 10 other soldiers to do that. It's just the three with the tools and the clippers and the wires and the bomb suits and all those trappings. When he gets home, that's another micro community. Also three, husband, wife, and child, but it's, it's all the trappings are different. All the, 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 the ladder and the cereal and the jack in the box, it's the different items that he can't quite wrap his head around. And what's interesting about Bigelow is that all of her films, whether or not they are, you know, her vampire film from many decades earlier, Near Dark, uh, with a very early and charismatic Bill Paxton. Um, and, you know, this film sort of, it, I would, I would call Near Dark probably her first big film. It has these action set pieces that kind of have the early blueprint we see develop in uh, The Hurt Locker. Um, but, the, you know, it's really about sort of this micro culture of these, these uh, hard rocking uh, vampires and as though if vampires really existed. But even the shot here, right, the dress is very particular. They're betting on bullets as much as money. Um, you know, she really digs into the culture of what these vampires would be like as much as it's sort of this action horror film. 
uh, her first film, Loveless, which is also co-directed with uh, a gentleman named Montgomery, also uh, Willem Dafoe's first film, if you don't count an uncredited role in, in uh, Days of Heaven. Anyways, uh, Loveless is a very strange movie, uh, but it has some elements that are classic Bigelow. Even though it's her first film, you can tell um, it's about this biker gang uh, that, that are sort of roaming the area, but it's all kind of localized in this one town. They stop in this one town for two nights. And there's these long sequences of the biker gang, um, this biker group, I should say, fixing the bikes with the wrenches and the chains, right? So it's just like with Hurt Locker, where we have all these tools and trappings and processes that are unique to the group. Detroit, um, one of her later films, 2018, I think it actually is the last film she's made, 2016, I should say. Um, not one of her best. It has some elements that are, that are not terrific, uh, but it is about one of the uprisings in Detroit in the 1960s. We get sort of smatterings of what the black media were dealing with in the South Side of Chicago, but we also get a sense of um, some of the rot that was in a historically corrupt police department. We see John Boyega here um, is one of the main characters in the film and he's wrestling with the cost of the insular micro community. So whereas with some of her films like The Hurt Locker or Loveless or uh, even Near Dark, although these vampires are definitely uh, villains in some ways, um, we can see that sort of community binds people. And then in Detroit, uh, a later film, we see that it has sort of that, that through line of corruption that John Boyega is pushing back against. And so what's interesting to me about this film, and I love this, this shot to end with, right? It's sort of not just all the trappings of military from the fatigues um, and, and even the bomb parts, but also the things that are sort of unique to them. We have the pieces of the Humvee and this like little stuffed animal here that's hanging there. Um, Bigelow's, I think, true skill is not sort of how she's become this uh, consummate action director. And that's very true. Uh, but it's also the way that she's always had this attention to these micro communities. She knows how to sort of focus on those details uh, over a range of different films. I'll note that uh, in December, so the last film of, of 2020, and then we'll be taking a break in January before we pick up in February of 2021, uh, we're going to be watching Chadwick Boseman, uh, who just passed in August, Chadwick Boseman's role as uh, Marshall the future Supreme Court Justice. And Marshall, um, starring Chadwick Boseman, directed by Reginald Hedlund, uh, is not only a, a great film, a great historical document, uh, Chadwick Boseman, of course, has done a number of these films where he plays iconic roles throughout African-American history. So here, Marshall, um, he was uh, Jackie Robinson in 42, one of his earliest films. Uh, I just saw a trailer actually for uh, a new historical drama he's going to be in, obviously posthumously since he's passed, but filming finished on um, Ma Bailey's... Uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. That's it, right? Based on August Wilson play, really looks outstanding. So he's got this sort of vein, obviously Chadwick Boseman also was Black Panther, I should say. He has this vein of like historical dramas based on these historical icons. And so we're gonna be tackling Marshall, again, also shot partially in Buffalo, New York. So all of our Buffalo fans that have been tuning in, uh, we'll, we'll get a little taste of that. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for that, uh, that film catch. I just saw the, the trailer today, so uh, the, the name is not, uh, is not there. No problem. Uh, me and Ronnie are, are eagerly looking forward to that movie. He's a big August Wilson fan. Uh, but, but thank you, Mike. Uh, another fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to invite uh, our fellow uh, visitors here, if they would like to turn their videos back on to rejoin us for uh, if they have any questions to ask. You could also leave your video off if you want to. Uh, and ask questions. There, there's our two folks here. Very good. Um, but yes, thank you. That was a very interesting look at that film. Um, a lot, lots to chew on that I had not considered from from that movie. Not a, not usually a big war movie fan, me personally. But right. you definitely made a good point about that. You know, it's not the typical war movie. Um, not at all. Uh, but lots to think about. Does anybody out there have any uh, questions or comments for Mike? I see. I think Dan has a, a question. Before we get to, to that, uh, Dr. Reif, I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of chatter in the chat box. Um, oh, really? Someone named Annie says, "Thank you for a great presentation. Please review Moonstruck." And then <laughs> someone named David is is chatting in as well. Yes, Moonstruck. Um, 
Whoa. Now, now keep in mind, uh, fans, uh, long-time listeners, I appreciate that, uh, that we're only able really to stream films that are free. We want to make sure this is equitable to all uh, uh, comers. So whenever Moonstruck comes to IMDb, especially, or I will take a look. I'll take a look to see if it's free elsewhere. We will I review Moonstruck. What's that? Get your bootleg version. Uh, that's that's not what we're doing. We're not doing bootleg versions, sir. Uh, we're we're going to keep it legitimate for all comers. Uh, but I appreciate the passion. I will note the Criterion Collection, which is the gold standard of, of curating films, important films, artistic films, has just issued an addition of Moonstruck. So that wow. if, if there was ever a vote of confidence for that important film starring Nicolas Cage and Cher, um, and I'm, I'm not being facetious here. I mean, oh. if Criterion picked it up, Moonstruck is definitely important. Um, also, Kill Bill has come up from, from uh, thank you, Mr. Spaduti, I appreciate that. Um, I would say, yeah, if we're going to do a Tarantino film, it may pop up for free on IMDb. We'll talk about that when it's got some cool stuff in it. Um, I love Moonstruck, yeah. i got to say. I love Moonstruck. So I'm you love Moonstruck, too. There we go, Alex. See? There's another one. Well, your father you know, if it has elements of, of the holiday season, it might show up there. Yeah. Uh, but Dr. Reif, you have a question. Well, actually, at the point uh, I want to make, I wonder if the director was familiar with the uh, program that was on BBC, I guess it was about 30 years ago, called USB. Mm. The same topic of, 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 of uh, deactivating, deactivating the bomb that fell on London. Mm. And again, they mm. had to uh, figure out how to, how, to, how to deactivate them and how to uh, make sure they didn't blow up. Occasionally, they did blow up, and the people that were undoing them were, uh, were, were killed. Yes. Mm. They had uh, interesting information about how they had, had figured out uh, that the bombs had been fixed so that if you took the, the new version of part of the old way, it would still go up. Uh, mm. But they had to be uh, careful about realizing, okay, this is a slightly different version of the bombs that had fallen before, and thus, so there was a lot of technical information as well as the human drama about that sort of thing, of the bombs that had fallen. On London and uh, had to be had to be uh, uh, saved from from blowing up. So that sure. would be. I wonder if it's something she said. Let's do a modern version of that with more mm. personal point of view rather than just. Yes, the, right. There was a lot of personal tragedy to that. Yeah, yeah, and this would be a modern version of the UXB one. Which the dates I don't remember, but I think it was about thirty years. Ago. Well, it's a fascinating uh, example. I've not heard of that. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that one. It's and it, it strikes me, it strikes me though, right, uh, that, uh, you know, what's interesting about USB then from your telling of it is that, you know, it's British individuals defusing bombs in, in England. Whereas here we have American troops in Iraq. So we have this kind of different context that sort of raises the stakes, but um, for them, because they're in a country that's not their own. And so, um, as opposed to in USB, where they're sort of what cleaning up the remnants of a war that came to their shores. Um, for another sort of uh, ominous bomb film, just off the top of my head, there's also the great uh, Guillermo del Toro film, The Devil's Backbone, which features a, a boy's orphanage. It's a horror film. Uh, before it features a boy's orphanage where this bomb has dropped into the middle of the courtyard but hasn't gone off and so it's the sort of heavy symbol that's kind of hanging over them will it ever go off they hear like a ticking inside is it a ghost um so an interesting way that sort of bombs throughout different wars that's the spanish civil war uh, against franco and then you've got world war ii sort of the, the iconography of this 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 object that can do damage and can do violence but also is just sitting there it isn't, it isn't the, the bullet, which, you know, moves quickly and then it's gone. It's sort of this ominous threat that's hanging there, yeah. Sort of Schrodinger's destruction. <laughs> yeah, I also don't believe in Schrodinger's cat, but yes, continue. <laughs> you know, Mike, a lot of those scenes where you talked about, it, they're showing the children. Yeah. And then the wife with the clothes and all that. And then it shows the men, you know, kind of staring down and all that. Yeah. A lot of that is they're not really sure whether they're friend or foe, mm -hmm. those people that are looking down at them. That's right. And I, know, I know a lot of those uh, IEDs, those, those, those bombs were set off by cell phones, mm -hmm. you know? So at any one time, they're mm -hmm. looking at these gentlemen or these, these people all around, not knowing which one was gonna possibly trigger that bomb off. Right. So it was kind of like, yeah, they're running, 
their everyday lives, but at any time, one of these guys could be against them. You know, mm -hmm. so is that that strife or that turmoil of what do I do with these people watching me? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's here. absolutely right. Have to absolutely right. That that it's actually happening, mm -hmm. um, or else you go crazy trying to defuse these bombs and maybe right. Renner's figure actually went a little crazy because mm -hmm. of that whole thing. And then that young man with PTSD, that blonde, I mean, you just go nuts after a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, where, yeah. Was, where was this shot? I'm just curious. That I don't know. I have Morocco in mind. Right. Uh, I believe it was filmed in Morocco, but usually films that are set in Iraq or, or sort of a Middle Eastern location are usually shot in Morocco or Jordan at this time. Um, uh, you know, now and also the time of the filmmaking, 2009. So those are the two popular locations for so this, sometimes Saudi Arabia, like the film The Kingdom uh, with Jamie Foxx, but um, that one's set in Saudi Arabia, so it makes sense. But usually it's Morocco or Jordan. I'm seeing Amman. There you go. Oh, really? Amman? Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. In the countryside there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Potentially, yeah. They, they probably had a dusty town they could fix up a little bit for this, so yeah. Uh, so folks um thank you so much for tuning in uh 9 45 so i think we'll leave it there uh another successful round alex i appreciate you hosting this um and then in, in a month we'll be talking about an american uh icon absolutely well we appreciate you you uh, offering your insights mike thank you very much Thanks, also an iconic thank you. city of buffalo new york that's, that's right town. we love yeah. buffalo <laughs> Uh, thank you, folks, for joining us. It's always good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, Thanks you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.